the COVID epidemic has taught us that there are some massive failures in the American healthcare delivery system. We have poor access to information. We have poor connectivity. Uh, we have inconvenient care for many patients. Uh, we have caregivers that do not work as teams uh, with each other in the way we would really like them to work with each other. And we, we have some serious uh, delays in learning and in sharing information between caregivers. And those things were all kind of invisible when we were buying all care by the piece and it was completely off the radar screen and we were using the old care delivery sites and mechanisms. But many of them are now extremely visible and that gives us some real opportunities and challenges going forward. And I, and I know, Judy, you have had years of commitment to making care better. You have been trying to improve care with the toolkit that you have available um, for, for years, and that has been a, a major passion. And so the COVID situation has actually created some opportunities, I think, uh, for you in that space and in that direction. And, and my question to you is, uh, what, what's EPIC doing to respond uh, to COVID? And what kinds of things um, will I actually make care better uh, from what you're doing? That makes sense? Yeah, and I think there's two parts to it. One, COVID in specific, and two, healthcare in general. And so COVID in specific, um, we got calls from uh, one of the states to say they need several thousand extra beds with our software in it, mm -hmm. in a brand new site, and they'd like it in three days. Three, three days. days. Three yep. days. It takes a lot more than three days to put a brand new system in. And then we figured, okay, we have to figure out how to do it. And it, we actually got it done uh, for a number of different places. The average was between one day and seven days. And I think we put in 92,000 new beds with software because wow. we had to learn how to redo everything. So that was for yeah. COVID. But for not COVID, what we're trying to do is figure out what did we learn that we can make these things better and faster for health systems so that it doesn't take so long and cost so much to keep information about their patients. So that, those are good learnings. Uh, we did a lot of other things for COVID too that we had to learn, drive through uh, testing sites, uh, setting up Javits in New York and McCormick Place in Chicago and my and Hope in Boston, but my favorite was the U.S. Navy ship Comfort, which we did set up, uh, but uh, it didn't, in the end, have that many patients. So uh, installing telehealth and watching telehealth, that's going to be a real change for healthcare around the country. It went huge. It's huge. And now it's coming down, but it's not back to where it used to be. It's it never still, will. I mean, it, yeah. it never will. Yes. Tele telehealth is is exploding, and it's a actually a wonderful unintended benefit from the whole process, That's because right. when people get a chance to experience it, they discover they like it, and caregivers actually find it to be very useful. So you've been supporting telehealth as well. That's right, and I think we as a country have to figure out. What do we do for health, telehealth with the indigent population who don't yeah. have the access to it? Yes. In fact, the, the mental health treatment uh, caregivers have been saying that they actually prefer telehealth in many ways because of the convenience and the access and, and avoiding. But the lower income patients are in the community clinics are not finding telehealth to be a good mental health tool because the patients don't have any privacy. You're also doing um, mental health, telehealth support? Right. And one of the things that one of our mental health providers for pediatrics said to us, that he thought he was going to lose a lot uh, not having the child right there. 
But what he did was he got was able to see what the child's room is like, what the posters are on the wall, who the yep, siblings yep. are as they run by, uh, the stuffed animals on the bed, a whole different view of the patient that made him feel he learned a lot about the patient. That's a good point. I, I suspect the mental health uh, counseling probably has some similar benefits. Because you can point the camera to the room you're in, and that creates a context that you can only describe, I suppose, in the actual counseling room. So that's a positive thing. One, one of the issues with um, this whole process has been that there's been learning going on. There, there's science being developed, and my understanding is that you've also expanded uh, what you're doing with your support of the learning process. Well, uh, we had a lot of training to do, especially in telehealth. We had to train 5,000 people. Uh, I, and I think all together we're trying to figure out learning is so important. And it yep. is in using, certainly in using the electronic medical record, the very first thing for our customers that has been studied as being the most important is good, good training, good learning. Yep. And then yep. the second thing is setting the system up to personalize it for how you specifically work. So learning, training, the most critical thing. In a medical library um, that, that does, keeps caregivers current on recent developments, I think is something else you've been working on. Yes, uh, we created a website called ehrn. Yeah. Dot org. Yes. And what EHRN does is it is studying the data from our customers' patients. And that allows us to have access to somewhere between 100 million and 200 million patients right now. Eventually, it will be more than 200 million uh, in the whole database of everyone that contributes. And EHRN is looking at that data and trying to find out, especially with COVID right now, what is there that we should share? The reason we created the HRN is we started doing some studies on the data and then realized that if we send the results of those studies to some of the very highly respected journals, it will take months for it to get out. And things like mortality rates with ventilators wasn't, were important to get out right away. Yeah. Or is there any preventive drug that helps uh, reduce the effects of COVID. That would be important to get out right away. And so we created EHRN so that a study could be done and it could be published rapidly. Now, eventually EHRN will go beyond COVID studies, which is where it is right now. And uh, this uh, one that we just did, I thought was very interesting. And that was, uh, we did uh, a, a COVID study on asthma. And we found out that young children through up about 20 years old, if they have asthma, they get COVID worse. And really? the, uh, if you're older, it doesn't, no. help, it doesn't hurt you as much. That was a real surprise. Another thing we're doing that I think is really interesting is called best care for my patient. And that means that we're gonna take the data, which we brought into a great big database called Cosmos. And the Cosmos data then will help the clinician by telling the physician what has worked best for patients similar to the patient the physician is uh, trying to decide what to do. And right now, we've been told that there's only about 10% evidence-based medicine. So this will move it, and, and everyone wants to make a decision based on the evidence. They don't want it just to be anecdotal. So this will help uh, clinicians make decisions on observational evidence-based medicine. Yeah, there's been a relatively small amount of research, well, obviously no research done into that disease at all. And now that there's a learning curve going on, yeah, really good to uh, share that learning curve and to get the information out and then to get it out in, in convenient ways that are useful to the caregiver. So you you made a commitment to go down that path with that tool. Um, that's a good thing. So, and that kind of reinforces your care everywhere 
um, model? Right, because what Care Everywhere does is it pulls in data from all over about the patient. And I, I've often thought that if you're, I, I think of it as if you're in the ship comfort and here comes a gurney with the patient. And all you know is the patient's name, you can estimate the age and a few other things, but it's just a body lying there. How do you take good care of that patient? Yep. But if you have interoperability and can, you can look up all that information about the patient, suddenly you see what's really going to be important to help you treat that patient. To me, it's a huge difference. And that's what interoperability is able to do. I think one of your people told me you've got something like 6.7 million care everywhere links being made every day. That is right. We have Does that it? many exchanges every single day. And about 40% are not with Epic to Epic. It's with Epic and another vendor, which is oh, good. Really? Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. So the Care Everywhere agenda is beyond just Epic. Yes, Care Everywhere will pull in data all about the patient from Epic and from any other healthcare system that uses the standards and has signed up with Care Equality. And if they have done that, then that data can be pulled in too. And most care is now computerized. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we've been talking about um, healthcare for years is we need to get care on the computers. And once we get it on the computers, we then need to get it connected. And, and we've got now toolkits, including the new fire um, mechanisms that are being set up. And, and people are taking the fire toolkit that consolidates data from multiple electronic sources and um, creates potential uh, improved care patterns for patients in that space and, and uh, I think the, there's a fire um, agenda for cancer right now that is trying, attempting to put together kind of a cancer moonshot to identify best uh, practices for cancer patients. Um, and my understanding also is that Epic is supporting that and adding data to that um, process. Is that we accurate? Do, yes, we do a lot of that. We do a huge amount of that. Funny to talk about fire. <laughs> yeah, fire by the fire. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yes, uh, heavily involved with fire. And I think the key to many things is standardization as well. We have to standardize the data elements so that when they're shared, it could be understood what the data elements mean. If in fact we send over information that's uninterpretable, to the receiver, it doesn't make any sense to send it. So there's a great importance in standardizing the data so it can be shared. So what, what percentage, this country is now heavily, heavily computerized and the meaningful use funding helped that hugely. Uh, what percentage of American hospitals today still do not have an EMR? Is there any, are there any left? Uh, critical access hospitals. Um, rural clinics, certainly almost any larger healthcare organization is computerized. So what about community clinics as well? Uh, they tend to be pretty much computerized now? Well, the, uh, at least the federally qualified community clinics? Yes, the so federally qualified community clinics, uh, I don't know what percent of them are computerized. I'm going to guess it's about uh, 50%, but I don't know if that is correct. Oh, really? I thought it might be uh, higher. Yeah, well, that's a bit of a guess, but I was surprised when I saw some statistics that it didn't seem to be as high as I thought it would be. Yeah. And we at Epic have said that our customers can extend out to a federally qualified health center and uh, no license fee, no maintenance fee. It could just be for free. Uh, really? up to a certain size. And that got a whole lot of additional ones on. I think part of the reason for that is my husband is a physician who worked at FQHC. So uh, I, I really wanted to see what we, uh, yeah, I wanted to see what we could do for that. <laughs> well, was 
Wasn't his practice the original inspiration for your starting Epic? No, it was not. Uh, I started Epic. Starting the medical record part of Epic. Yeah, uh, no, not, yeah, not, not at even all. Close. Okay. <clears throat> but his experience was critical for us doing interoperability. He's a pediatrician, and one of his patients who was under good control went with their family to another city and uh, was uh, taken ill, went to an ED and died. And over and over again, he kept saying, if they just had a record, she would have lived. And so that's why we started interoperability years before meaningful use required it. Hmm. And then when we started interoperability, what was really interesting is no one would take it. They were afraid to. And no one would take it? No, the compliance officers and the lawyers were too hesitant. Um, so they didn't want to send their data out. They didn't want to bring information in. The lawyers for the care side advised them initially not to take the data that for is not right. care? Yes. And so finally, when we got some people to uh, install it, uh, and I was a little bit part of it slowing down because I said, if you are going to have care everywhere, you need to be able to send it wherever the patient goes and not pick and choose where it goes. And so finally we had a CEO who gave a talk at our users group meeting who said that uh, one of his CIOs, well, his CIO came in, handed him a piece of paper and said, sign this, I need some software. He signed it without knowing what it was. And had he known what it was, he wouldn't have signed it. And that's what got care reviewer started. So it was really a lucky mistake. So yeah. if we look back on this year in, in, in Epic and COVID, what, what would be the thing that you um, are, are most happy about doing and, and what have you learned? Um, I think the thing I'm most happy about, oh, there's a whole bunch of things. It's, I can't yeah. put it to just one. It's yeah. creating the journal. Yeah. It's sharing the information with so many people as we find this information out. I think the ways to do installs quicker and uh, to do them less expensively is huge. How to train virtually and do well. We've had uh, several uh, live go, li go lives that are uh, virtual and they've gone well. Oh, so really? learning lots of interesting things. I think we've seen the uh, death rate go from a high percentage to a much lower percentage. I'm not sure if my numbers are right, but I heard at one point it was 30%, now it's down to two. That, if that is correct, that's a huge difference that is from all the learnings we've done with COVID. I think our publication on ventilators and mortality was a very critical publication because people then tried to take the patients and put them on their side or put them on their stomach yeah. rather than give them ventilators right away because the death rate in ventilators was pretty high. Yeah, and that's so, been a really powerful learning. Yeah. So we did a study early on, and that was one of the studies that made us want to get EHRN in existence to make sure that that data could get out there. Yeah. And then putting a tool together, which I, I love, that you make available to all your caregivers. So when learning like that happens somewhere, you've actually got a mechanism of sharing it. Yes. The traditional model of waiting for something to show up in a published medical journal takes forever. Yes. Um, years, and this you, you're doing it weeks right now. Days sometimes. Get it days. days. Exactly. Things. One of the things we're doing that's really interesting is as we study a new topic, we're putting two teams on it. The teams have data scientists and software developers and analysts and clinicians, but we're putting two teams on to the same problem. So a new one coming up is sepsis and COVID. Putting two people yeah. on, two teams on it and seeing what do they do differently and how do you compare the results of the two teams? I think that's going to be really interesting. That's going to be very interesting. It there's great learning, and the other thing about that learning is each of them will learn something slightly different, yes. and if there's an opportunity at the back end of that to blend it, then yes. you'll have a chance to yes. get collectively smarter. So it's not like there's a right answer, wrong answer. There's two 
right answers and how do you combine them to create a third right answer? That's right. So, so it's good to be in that learning curve and supporting that. Yeah, I think it's great. And the group was worried. They were saying just what you're saying, but we'll have different answers. And, uh, yeah. and we need to take that as good. a really neat thing to do, not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, it has been a great pleasure to have this conversation with you. Good to see you. And great to see you again, be safe too. and be well. Yes. Come down and visit us in Wisconsin. Yes. Not that far away, actually. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye.